respected viewers, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Current Events. I'm your host, Ali Jassim. Recently, the entire world witnessed the fruits of decades of crass negligence by the Saudi monarchy when more than a thousand Hajj pilgrims were crushed to death in what is being called a human stampede. The deaths occurred during the ritual known as the stoning of the devil, and this is not the first time something like this has happened. At least 270 were killed in 1994, 118 in 1998, 35 in 2001, 251 in 2004, and at least 346 in 2006, all during the same ritual. And in 1990, a similar stampede in a tunnel leading towards Mina caused the deaths of over 1,400 Hajj pilgrims, so much for being the guardians of the Haramain. Most amazing, perhaps, is that the Hajj only brings at best 2.5 million or so people to one place every year. Whereas Arba'in in Iraq regularly draws well over 15 million without any major incidents or mass casualties. This is while the Saudi regime has massive financial and human resources at its disposal, not to mention a high level of governmental and political organization, whereas Iraq has virtually none of these things. Based on the number and scale of repetition of this exact same tragedy in the past, it's not as though the Saudi regime didn't know something like this could happen. In fact, they reconstructed the entire stoning area after 2006, supposedly to prevent another stampede. Sure, it only took them more than 15 years to figure it out that it might be worthy addressing, but better late than never, right? Well, based on this year, apparently not. More amazing still is that, instead of taking responsibility for its catastrophic failure to protect the Hajj pilgrims, the criminally negligent Saudi monarchy has been working round the clock to blame the pilgrims themselves. According to the Saudi health minister, the stampede was perhaps because some pilgrims moved without following instructions by the relevant authorities. He also said, this type of accident could have been avoided. However, this is God's will. What sort of psychopath believes that God's will is to murder his guests by the hundreds? The Saudi sort, apparently. Yet, video and witness testimonies suggest the stampede occurred because of the overcrowding due to the presence of the Saudi prince's entourage. According to this, 7 out of 13 roads were closed due to the presence of the prince and his convoy, forcing pilgrims coming from different directions to converge at a point, leading to panic and stampede. Of course, the health ministry aren't the only ones blaming the pilgrims. Their so-called Grand Mufti has absolved the Saudi royals of any wrongdoing, saying that the obvious man-made disaster was simply fate. Reuters reports that Abdul Aziz al-Sheikh told Crown Prince Mohammed bin Naif in a televised statement, you are not responsible for what happened. You are dealt with the beneficial factors that were in your hands and within your ability. As for the things that humans cannot control, you cannot be blamed for them. Fate and destiny are always inevitable. He then went on to blame all criticism being leveled at the corrupt monarchy as the result of envy, even saying, many are envious of the kingdom for its religion, the same religion that produced Al-Qaeda and Daesh or ISIS. Some mouthpieces of the regime have even gone so far as to blame Iran and the Shiites for the stampede, which may be in part because so far Iran has been one of the only countries to issue unusually harsh criticism towards the Saudi government, adding that what happened, it is not incompetence, it is a crime. Stay with us in this episode as we discuss the unbelievable tragedy of the 2015 Hajj in depth here on Current Events. My guest for this episode is the Imam of one of the largest Shiite centers in the world, and an expert in Hajj and Arba'in pilgrimages. Please welcome my guest, Sheikh Abbas Panju. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, and it is always an honor um, to be able to participate and to serve through Imam Hussein TV. We apologize to our dear viewers for the low quality of the video due to the poor internet connection. Sheikhna, as we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, this is not the first time something like this has happened. Why hasn't the Saudi government done more to ensure the protection of the Hajj pilgrims? Sure. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Wa la'natullahi ala a'da'ihim ajma'in ila qiyami yawm al-deen. Um, in response um, to your question, uh, my dear brother, when it comes to the science of administering and um, facilitating uh, the Hajj 
um, as a ritual for all Muslimin. You will find that this art or this science uh, includes a number of dimensions. When it comes to facilitating the Hajj, facilitating for the Hujjaj, um, ensuring their security, ensuring that they are able to perform um, their acts of worship um, in a way that facilitates for the spirituality, you will see that there are multiple dimensions in that um, there is the dimension of arranging the logistics um, from the time that you enter into the country, um, whether it is a port of entry at Jeddah or uh, Medina al Munawwara, um, arranging logistics for Hujjaj to move between Medina and Mecca and from Mecca to Mina and Arafah and the Mash'ar. So you find that the first dimension of uh, facilitating for the Hujjaj is the dimension of logistics. And then in the security personnel, emergency personnel, um, you need to have contingency measures. Uh, if there does happen a disaster or if there, there is any sort of um, accident that occurs, to have a contingency plan where you are able to um, secure and evacuate and ensure that there is a minimum damage or a minimum number of casualties that occur when such a large number of people occur in one place. All these logistical and security personnel and emergency contingency plans, all these dimensions on one side. On the other hand, you find that this in itself is not enough because what the Ministry of Hajj would possibly come forward and say is that we have spent millions if not billions of dollars in trying to ensure that we upgrade the facilities and expansion and so on and so forth to facilitate for the Hujjaj. However, you will find that in response to this issue of the tragedy, majority of the times you will find that the Saudi government or the Ministry of the Hajj will come forward and will say that they are doing everything possible to control the large numbers of Hujjaj who are coming into Arabia. In that, these numbers of two to three million people is a great number of people to manage in relatively constrained or areas such as Mina or Arafa or Mecca. And you will find this has actually been the primary region for the Saudi government to, uh, to carry forward with expansions of the Haram. And this is the same excuse, the increasing number of Hujjaj in the millions. This has been the same reason for them which they have used to destroy a number of historic shrines over the years. And our response to them is that the increasing number of Hujjaj cannot be an excuse, number one, for destroying historic sites. And an example for this is a practical example is the Ziyara Arbainiya in Karbala al-Muqaddas. You have people that are ten times greater than the number of Hajj that are coming in. If in Hajj you have two to three million people, well in Arbain, you have close to 20 to 30 million people who come to visit the city of Karbala. Much as it is constrained, much as it is small, you don't find that in Karbala people come out and say, oh, because we want to facilitate for 20 million people, we need to start destroying all the other historic sites which, which uh, exist inside of Karbala. So, for example, you cannot say that we will destroy, for example, Maqam Aliyun al-Akbar to facilitate for 40 million hujjaj la so what we find over here is that uh, the reason which is given to destroy a number of shrines is not accurate and cannot be blamed on the large number of people that come as hujjaj answering your question uh, habibi haji controlling the large number of people the solution does not only lie in logistical measures rather the administration of a large number of hujjaj, the solution to this lies within the fiqh of Ahlul Bayt. So long as the fiqh of Ahlul Bayt in regards to the manasik of hajj is not embraced and is not made a part of the hajj rituals, calamities like these and stampedes like these will continue to happen. If you allow me to give you a couple of examples from our fiqh. So what, I'm, what we are trying to say is that the fiqh of Ahlul Bayt, if it is implemented by the Saudi Ministry of Hajj, 
you will find that it will be easier to facilitate for two to three million people in fact it will be possible to facilitate for 10 to 20 million people if the uh, the rules within the manasik uh, of hajj which are taught to us by the fake of imam sadiq are implemented you see the the issue of the stampede uh, there are a number of theories that are out there but if you go for example with the excuse that the stampede occurred because there was a vast number of people in Mecca and the area is not able to contain or the judge did not follow instructions that were given to us or that were given to them. Basically, the entire idea is that you have a large number of people in a very small area and when you are not able to control the traffic between these great numbers of people, you have stampedes and tragedies consequently tragedy these occur over fake for example you refer to one of the most any basic uh, book in regards to the manasik of Hajj, and uh i will read to you some of the clothes that we have by way of example from the manasik of hajj you have one of the most important rituals in hajj which is the wukuf in arafah if you refer back to the fiqh of Ahlul Bayt, you will find that our maraja have uh, made it clear to us that when it comes to being in Arafah, we have two designated times. You have the wukuf ikhtiyari and then you have the wukuf ikhtiyari, meaning that you have an official, you have a designated time of wukuf in Arafah, which is the normal time of wukuf. And then you have an emergency time of wukuf. So the normal time of the wukuf, the wukuf ikhtiyari, is on the day from the time of noon up till the time of sunset. However, you find that our fix stipulates from the wukuf ikhtiyari. Yani, there are certain categories of hujjaj who are exempted from performing the wukuf in Arafah during this designated time. So instead of performing the wukuf between noon and sunset, these category of hujjaj who are given the exemption are actually able to perform their wukuf in Arafah during the night time. So that is from the time of Maghrib until the time of Fajr. Uh, this is on the eve of Hajj. So, you take for example this consideration, this ruling from the fiqh of Imam al-Sadiq. The people who are exempted from the standing at night or those who qualify for the exemption during the night are the elderly people, the sick people, the women. Similarly, when it comes to Mina or when it comes to the Mash'ar, you will find that there are three designated times for standing within the uh, mashar or in Mina. So for example, you will find that there are exemptions that are granted to the women, to the children, to those who are sick, even those people who suffer from claustrophobia, in that they cannot be, uh, they cannot stand and they cannot um, sustain being in an overly crowded place. You find that our Sharia gives them exemptions to perform the wukuf or to, to be in Arafah or to be in the Mashar or to perform the Rami at exempted times. So instead of being in Arafah, for example, during the daytime from noon to night, they are allowed to be in Arafah from night till Fajr. In Mina, instead of performing the Rami of the Jamarat during the daytime, they are allowed to do it during the night time. If we were to embrace these teachings of Ahlul Bayt, Shaykhuna, you look at the people who are exempted from the wukuf ikhtiyari, women, children, elderly, the sick, those who suffer from claustrophobia. These rules, actually, one of the benefits from that is crowd control. Subhanallah, from three million hujjaj who are there in Mina, you count how many are women, how many are children, how many are elderly. How many become sick due to constipation or dehydration? How many of them suffer claustrophobia? Say very safely, say one third of them. Free honey from a million people, close to uh, or 300,000 of them, straight away you have decongested.
the the traffic inside of Arafah and and the Muzdalifah and Mina just by implementing this one ruling from the fiqh of Ahlul Bayt. In that instead of you having all one million people in one place at one time, when you follow the fiqh of Ahlul Bayt, you find those who are granted exemption, their wukuf is at a different time. Those who are able-bodied, their wukuf is at a different time. And the wisdom or one of the wisdoms behind this is that you are able to control the crowd and you are able to decongest the traffic which exists in these areas. If you decongest the traffic, then there are less chances for stampedes like this to happen. Therefore, this is just by way of a very simple example. Therefore, our answer to this is that so long as the Saudi government or the Ministry of Hajj does not take into consideration the fiqh of Ahlul Bayt when it comes to administering and managing the Manasik al Hajj, unfortunately, tragedies like these will continue to, uh, to happen. And even though we pray for them not to happen, we feel that us as followers of Ahlul Bayt, uh, we have a very positive suggestion in how we can contribute through our fiqh to ensure that tragedies like these and stampedes like these do not have to happen again in the future. Sheikh, how is it possible that Iraq can host eight or nine times as much pilgrims at once during Arba'in without any incidents? with much fewer resources at his disposal, while tragedies like this one seem to be regular occurrences during Hajj. Absolutely. Um, the first thing over here is that um, anybody who is open-minded and anybody who is sincere um, uh, in, from, from the heart will be able to tell you that the revolution or the commemoration of the revolution of Imam al Hussein, the commemoration of the ziyara of Imam al Hussein, most definitely, without a doubt, without a shadow of a doubt, is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you see, this is tawfiq ilahi, in that a country that does not possess perhaps even half of the resources that uh, the Arabian government or the Saudi monarch holds despite having half those resources, despite having half that wealth, they are able to facilitate an event which is ten times more grand and more magnificent in terms of numbers uh, during the Ziyara uh, Arbainiya as opposed to uh, the advent of Hajj. But the first thing that we notice is, is that this is the Lutf Ilahi number one. Number two, you find that the success of the Ziyara Arba'iniya, if you were to look outside of the factor of the Ghaib, this divine factor that protects the Zawar of Imam al Hussein, outside of this, practi uh, uh, if you were to look at it on the ground from a very materialistic level, the success of the Karbala largely is due to the freedom which is given to the Zawar in performing their ziyara and the rights of their ziyara. You find that because of this freedom and the flexibility and the ability of the people, Iraqi nations as a whole to be a part of the ziyara, to be able to host without there being strict government impositions and uh, imposition on the freedom of the Zawar, you find that as the people are free to choose their routes, how they want to get to Karbala, on which days they want to get to Karbala, you find over here that obviously the system is much more manageable by granting the Zawar their freedoms and uh, by allowing to walk at their own pace, by not imposing upon them unnecessary barriers or unnecessary restrictions you find that if you grant the people their freedom and you embrace the act of worship in the spirit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained, you find that events like these will be stampede free um, if the Hajj uh, as an act of worship was to embrace in the spirit that uh, Ahlul Bayt wanted us or the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us, you would find that the majority of these stampedes and the majority of these calamities would not happen. 
As far as the Muslim world is concerned, the only function of the Saudi government and sole purpose for existence is to be the guardians of the Haramain, so to say. How is it that time after time they have managed to fail so miserably at this? See, um, in regards to this, I think the issue is much greater at hand. With all due respect uh, for the tragedies that have occurred and for, for the deaths that have been suffered, uh, the issue over here which the Muslim world needs to wake up to is much greater than the stampede in itself. The stampede and the deaths which occurred uh, on the day of Eid at Mina is a single highlight of a number of major problems that exist within al Saud branding and marketing themselves as Khadam al Haramain or, or the leader of the monarch being called Khadim al Haramain. Khadim al Haramain means what? Yani, the protector of the custodians of the Haram. This title is given to him at what? At, at, for what reason? What have they done to achieve this title or to be deserving of this title? The same person who says that he is the custodian of the Haramain is responsible for destroying close to 90% of the historic sites that exist in Medina. Islamic heritage, Islamic legacy. This is a part of our history and a part of our identity. How many of these sites have been destroyed? The sites of the grave, the graves of the grandson of Rasulullah in Janatul Baqi, the house where the Prophet was born. I mean, for you to just go and visit the cave of Hira, which is supposed to be a point of inspiration, where you as a follower and a lover of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, for you just to go there and to see where did the Prophet receive this divine revelation and for you to seek inspiration from that, you find that there are 1001 barriers that are given to you. Today, you have that for nine months, Rasulullah would go to the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Sayyida Fatima during the time of Salat and would say to them, um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to perform the Salat and would recite the verse, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ رِجْسَ أَحْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُتَحِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا For nine months, Rasulullah would go to this house and he would knock on the door, where is this house today? Do we have access to it? Are we able to see it? You find that Rasulullah lived in Medina for 10 years. Where did he used to pray? Where was his mihrab? Where did he used to say, stay? Where did he used to eat? Which are the different mosques that are there in Medina? The Battle of Khandak, where did it happen? The Battle of Khaybar, where did it happen? Battle of Badr, Battle of Ahad, all these historic places that exist over there. Why is the Muslim world deprived of visitation of all these sites? If you call yourself the custodian of the Haramain, you need the custodian of the Haram of Rasulullah, you need to be the custodian of the legacy and the history of Rasulullah. Therefore, for the Muslim world, we need to wake up the larger Muslim world and we need to see these people who have placed themselves in a position of authority and who have granted themselves titles in regards to custodians of the shrines of the Holy Prophet and the shrine of Mecca, in reality, do their actions match their words? Do their actions match their titles? Muslim Ummah needs to wake up in regards to this and they need to critique their leaders or critique those people who have taken the position of leadership and they should judge them by their actions and through this we are able to see who is truthful in their words and who is not truthful, who is pretending to be a Muslim, who is really a Muslim, who is truly a follower of Rasulullah and who is an enemy of Rasulullah. Therefore, events like these and the general attitude of Ali Saud towards the Hujjaj, towards the uh, historic sites of Islam, towards other Muslims, their actions need to be judged and the Muslim world really needs to wake up and see that are these truly the role models of Islam and the guardians of Islam in this day and age or not? Sheikh, what does it say about the Saudi regime when a tragedy like this comes immediately on the heels of the crane collapse that took hundreds of lives just weeks earlier? Um, again, in regards to the collapse of the crane, 
which belonged to the uh, Bin Laden construction company. Um, you know, uh, there are a number of um, theories and a number of reasons that have been uh, granted within the media. Um, but, um, you know, to get a very conservative opinion in terms of trying to be um, or trying to deal with this with minimum speculation, the very least that can be said about this crane accident is that the collapse of the crane in itself, you know, it's a demonstration of the lack of compliance when it comes to security and safety measures within the construction industry. This is something which Ali Saud and the Khalij, um, unfortunately, they've been guilty of this crime, not only inside of Arabia, but within the Middle East. You look at the construction of a number of the buildings within uh, uh, within the Middle Eastern countries, be it Qatar, or be it in Dubai, and you know, you read about the incidences of the number of deaths that have occurred of construction workers um, just due to this lack of regulation, this lack of compliance to rules and regulations has led to unnecessary number of deaths. And this is a general attitude which again ties back to your previous question. You know, when we call ourselves Muslims, we call ourselves custodians of the shrines and custodians of the principles of Islam. Does Islam teach us to cut corners when it comes to um, uh, to work like this, or does Islam teach us to be honest and to be compliant to rules and regulations, even if they cost us when it comes to, uh, even if it costs us financially? So this lack of regulations, compliance to regulations, this, uh, uh, lack of compliance to health and safety, it shows us and it reflects a general attitude of carelessness from the leaders, and this is what we need to address. As the Saudi government continues its criminal war in Yemen and prepares for the execution of Shiite rights activist Sheikh Nimr Bakr al-Nimr and his nephew Ali al-Nimr, is there potential for the most recent Hajj tragedy to draw the world's attention to these other issues as well? Uh, absolutely. In fact, um, uh, when you refer back to the verse of Hajj, and um, when you study the philosophy behind the Hajj, and um, uh, the, 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 when you are to study the philosophy behind Hajj, you will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al Hajj um, himself, if you allow me to read the verse of the Quran, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in Surah Al Hajj, verse number. Um, 27 and 28 وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse commands uh, for the call of Hajj to be made such that people from every corner of the world from vast places may come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they may witness benefits for them. يَشْحَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ These benefits, manafi' plural of manfa' manafi' what type of benefits are the hujjaj supposed to benefit from through the performance of hajj? Spiritual benefits, economic benefits, political benefits, social benefits, these are all the benefits that we are supposed to uh, enrich our lives from through this institution known as Hajj. Therefore, one of the parts of Hajj, one of the important dimensions of Hajj is that it is supposed to be a social and a political convention where the Muslims get together, they discuss their political affairs, their, what affects their daily lives, what is perceived to be an opportunity, what is perceived to be a threat, and together they strengthen themselves as a single Muslim Ummah. Hajj is supposed to be that single experience which unites Muslims from every part of the world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, إِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةٌ وَاحِدًا 
Hajj is supposed to be that experience which unites all the Muslims together from every part of the world. And when the Muslims from every part of the world come together and they see, Ya Subhanallah, the same people who are supposed to be the custodians of the shrines of Rasulullah, the same people who are supposed to be the image of Islam globally, are the same people who are killing their fellow Muslims in Yemen. Subhanallah. The one dropping the bomb says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. And the one being killed on the ground is also saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Muslims killing Muslims. Muslims themselves causing divisions within Muslims. We always used to say that this was the strategy and the tactics of the imperialists that they would rule and divide. They would conquer by dividing the people. And today we see that those who call themselves custodians of the Muslims are implementing the same strategy as that of the imperialists in that they are the ones causing divisions between Muslims. They are the ones who are funding war and bloodshed between the Muslims. Therefore, the Muslim Ummah as an Ummah needs to be a little bit mindful. They need to be aware when it comes to the political and ideological situation that surrounds us in that these people who are calling themselves as custodians of the religion, they themselves today are funding and actively promoting war and bloodshed between other Muslims. Can this be acceptable or not? Once the masses collectively start to realize this, um, through the help of media, through self-education, through this culture of seeking actively for the truth, once this awareness grows within the minds of the masses, you find that the masses themselves will stand up and will start to uh, negate and condemn this self-imposed leadership upon them. Sheikh, we have seen horrific images coming out of bodies being dumped in piles and badly mistreated. In similar past occurrences, the government has even been photographed using bulldozers to shovel and move dozens of bodies around. Is this indicative of a broader disdain for lives of average human beings by Saudi royalty, or is it rooted in their more or less sociopathic religious views? Um, in regards to the mistreatment of bodies, um, regardless um, of whether it is um, uh, the victims of the stampede in Mina or anywhere else, Habibi Haji, this reflects a general attitude from a people who do not observe the sanctity of life. You are able to judge the character and the attitude and the values of a person through their actions. Self speaks volumes. I mean, just the way the bodies were being cleared from Mena, the disrespectful manner in which the bodies were being dumped, um, this itself speaks for the values. Islam teaches us, Rasulullah taught us, that life is sacred. To take the life of one person falsely, to kill one person falsely is equivalent to killing an entire ummah. And that humanity, if you were to speak to a person who does not even subscribe to a religion, Aslan, and you talk to them on how a dead body should be handled, perhaps you would find more humanity from them. These actions reflect an attitude which is deeply rooted within them. And this attitude is lack of respect for human life. Images of dead refugee children have shocked the conscience of the world into action. What are the potential legal issues, Islamically speaking, around propagating images of these dead pilgrims? with the same goal in mind. Would this be permissible or not? Or should this be encouraged or discouraged? Um, in regards to um, propagating the pictures or the images of uh, the plight of the refugees, and particularly those of them um, who have died, you find that um, the jurists will, uh, will tell you that there are a number to be considered over here in that, number one, we need to go back into looking at the root reason for the propagation of, uh, of such pictures. Um, firstly, you know, the pictures uh, that are being published, uh, we need to ensure that, for example, these are not pictures that, um, that uh, unveil, for example, 
um, the the dignity of of uh, of of that that person, you know, uh, taking pictures, for example, uh, perhaps um, uh, revealing uh, their uh, revealing their privacy. Uh, obviously, pictures like those are um, pictures like those are 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 not uh, uh, acceptable from a religious perspective. Um, but however, when you have these general images um, that the media captures in regards to mass deaths, drownings, the plights of the uh, immigrants that are there, we need to look at when it comes to the permissibility of spreading these images. We need to look down at to the intention. It could be that a person or that an organization or that a country is promoting the mass propagation of these images for political reasons. They, they, we live at a time where people have the skill where they are able to manipulate the uh, sorrows and manipulate the uh, 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 you can say they are they are able to manipulate the suffering of a group of people in order to gain a political advantage these are there are certain type of opportunities to live and uh, their their goal is to politicize and to make opportunity uh, from uh, propagating pictures such as these to achieve their own political agendas obviously because their reasoning is wrong then for us to support such type of campaigns is is an issue of uh, ishkal however if a person is looking at this issue from the door of Amra bil Ma'roof, Nahyan al Munkar, to create awareness within the community, to awaken the conscience of the people, to guide them towards the truth, to guide them towards goodness, to guide them towards humanity, to guide them towards justice, and the pictures are propagated in order for noble divine values to prevail, then by all means, in this situation, the technology which is used to create the awareness is seen as a rahmah, is seen as a mercy. It is seen as a tool through which we are able to perform amra bil ma'roof and nahyan al munkar Yes. Um, with all the controversies surrounding the Saudis at a time when they are also chairing a UN human rights panel, and while news has just come that Saudi prince has been arrested in Los Angeles for committing a string of suspicious sex crimes, what does the future hold for the monarchy? And how badly has their image been hurt in the eyes of the world? Can it ever recover? Again, um, in regards to the monarchy, um, it is absolutely clear that for them, the position that they hold in that these are people who have taken religion to be a tool and a vehicle in order to gain political power and political muscle. Um, uh, over the people and again the responsibility comes down on the Muslim Ummah to recognize who of our leaders are true representatives and true ambassadors of Islam and how many of them are false in their claim of being ambassadors to, to Islam when I come and I see that this is a royal family who belongs to the family of the custodian of the Haramain, this person who is tomorrow going to get a position in, an, in a so-called Islamic government that is supposed to overlook the, uh, the welfare of the entire Muslim nation. Do I want people such as these to be in a position of power? Are these people who truly reflect the teachings of Rasulullah? Are these the people who reflect the teachings of the Quran within them? Therefore, when you see actions of the monarchy in this way, um, what we need to do on our side is that we need to invite the general Muslim Ummah to an awakening, to wake up from this deep slumber of unconditional obedience to these monarchs and groups of people who do not represent Islam, who in fact go on to damage Islam and go on to to ruin the image of Islam. I mean, not only is this a stain on 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 uh, on the royal family in terms of this un-Islamic uh, crimes and these uh, immoral acts for which uh, this royal has been uh, uh, arrested, 
But when you look at the general attitude, I mean, you look at the rising cases of Islamophobia in the West, uh, you look at the number of reasons why Muslim families, people born within Muslim families, are becoming non-practicing Muslims as a result of the negative image of Islam and Islamophobia, which boils down to the actions which are promoted and propagated and funded by royals such as these. It is a matter of time that the Muslim Ummah will wake up and realize that these are people who have taken the religion to be a mask and to be a, an excuse and a tool for them to to gain their own uh, political uh, gains and wealth in the dunya. And we pray for the Muslim Ummah to embrace the spirit of the Quran in that they become those who are conscious people, who are active people, who are able to realize leaders who are truthful and separate them from leaders who are false. I'm sure viewers are curious to know this next question. If this had happened in any other country in the world other than the world's largest oil producer, would the reaction of the U.S. and European countries be any different? If so, how? Um, I believe that, um, you know, had, uh, this is by way of a personal opinion. If this incident would have happened in any other country in the West, there would be an independent commission. And the key term over here is independent. An independent commission would be set up. And those who are responsible for a human tragedy such as this would be made accountable in a court of law and, and uh, you know, relative justice would have been dispensed. Um, and, um, you know, this is all due to a factor or to a, to, to a fundamental principle that life is sacred. Now, unfortunately, the countries which claim to propagate Islam, they do not subscribe to this fundamental principle that life is, uh, life is sacred. And therefore, you find that issues like these and uh, massacres like these, tragedies like these, to a great extent are unaccountable and in fact, they are justified. And you will find this, it was, um, uh, it was widespread within the news that, um, you know, one of the muftis who is, uh, who is funded from the paycheck of these corrupt monarch, he comes forward and he makes a public statement saying that this was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ajeeb. And it is even funny that a number of people, um, you know, the naive, the layman also fall into this trap and they say, La Sahih, we went for Hajj and this stampede happened, it was not in the control, it was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The yeah, will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this mentality is the mentality of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, mentality of Bani Umayyah. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, when Sayyidah Zainab al-Kubra, salawatullahi wa salam, or salawatullah wa salam, alayha, together with Imam al-Sajjad and the rest of the women, when they were brought captives into the palace of Kufa, what did Ibn Ziyad say? He says to Imam al-Sajjad that, praise be to Allah who killed your father, Hussein ibn Ali. Ajib. Who? He was responsible and had a hand in killing Imam Hussein in Karbala and he says, La, Allah killed them. Subhanallah. Today, <laughs> today, you fast forward 1400 years later, the regime is responsible for the stampede due to negligence, due to abandoning, for example, the fiqh of Ahlul Bayt. And you have their scholar, their grand mufti come and absolve those who are responsible of the crime by saying, La, it was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was in the control of Allah. For al qom abna al qom You see that the same mentality that existed there at the time of Bani Umayyah, they, these are the followers of Bani Umayyah and hence they will resort to the same excuse. So they try to justify Islamically all these tragedies and all these crimes that are committed by saying no this is part of the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Makkah uh, a place of Aman <laughs> not a place of tragedies and stampedes to be there therefore actions and stances like these um, the more these actions happen and uh, the more the monarchy indulges in uh, in uh, uh, acts of uh, violence and acts of negligence and oppression towards the Muslim Ummah in general, you find the more and more they expose themselves and the more and more the truth becomes absolutely clear. 
Now Prince Mohammed bin Naif has been appointed to head the inquiry into what happened. How can the world take such an inquiry seriously when the fox is being appointed to investigate what happened in the hen house, so to say? Ahsanto, uh, Habibi Sheikh, now you hit the paw, you hit the nail on the head. And uh, this is why we say that um, in order to resolve this, um, the key word in the commission being appointed to investigate um, this tragedy is that the commission needs to be independent. We cannot have, uh, we can, uh, otherwise there is a conflict of interest to appoint somebody from within the monarch um, to provide a, f a report and to perform an inquiry where potentially this inquiry will lead to uh, establishing the ignorance or establishing the negligence of that very same monarchy and it shows a conflict of interest therefore independence is uh, is the most crucial factor when it comes to setting up a commission which is credible a commission which is serious and a commission which is dedicated to ensuring that tragedies like these will not happen again rather than cover up uh, false and uh, cover up um, those who are responsible for this act is it possible that Muslim-majority countries around the world could band together to demand Saudi accountability, given the scale of this most recent outrage? Or are too many of them in the pocket of the regime, dependent on it either for financial support or a steady flow of Hajj visas, among other things? Uh, in regards to the response of the people, what we, uh, or in regards to the response, response to this tragedy is divided, perhaps one could say, into two parts. You have a political response from, uh, as in official political response, where foreign ministers from all the countries that are affected by this tragedy um, take up uh, diplomatic stances and diplomatic channels um, and uh, formal channels to address and to, um, you could say, to try and uh, form an official independent inquiry into what has happened this is one channel now the countries that will that are willing uh, to, to put such type of uh, political pressure in that country it depends on their political ties that they have with saudi uh, or, or with uh, arabia whether unfortunately uh, many times political decisions uh, that are taken, the only factor is not the welfare of the general masses. There are a number of factors and conditions that are taken in um, the repercussions of uh, trying to force such a commission on the Saudi regime and what the political uh, consequences of that will be. Keeping in mind that uh, oil is a, is, a, is a tool that can be used um, to dominate uh, foreign policies. Um, having said that, the other, the other uh, response is the response from the general masses and this is why you will find that during the course of the interview again and again we've placed that the importance of emphasize on the fact that it is the responsibility of the Muslim Ummah collectively to stand up against dhulma, to stand up against oppression to be very honest and to be very frank Look at the Muslim, the, look at the state of the Muslim nations today. Any nation that considers itself to be a Muslim or that has a Muslim majority, look at the political and economical disasters that they are experiencing right now. Despite being Muslims, despite being the followers of the best religion, a religion that guarantees them success in the dunya as well as in the akhirah, they are in the most sorry state of affairs. Why is it that the general larger public and the larger Ummah accept to be humiliated and do not have the courage to stand? Well, the question is why? It is because the Muslim Ummah is lacking inspiration from a revolutionary leader who can teach them and inspire them to stand up against the dhulm. Which is why we say to the people, embrace Imam al Hussein. Sayyid al Shaddad, the grandson of Rasulullah, is that personality who stood up against the greatest tyrant of his time, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, 
the, uh, who, who was at the head of the greatest empire that existed at that time. You find that Imam Hussein stands up with 72 people and is able to shake the very foundations of oppression and is able to bring down those leaders who oppressed the people in the name of Islam. Just like the way we have leaders who oppress people in the name of Islam today. Yet Imam al Hussein, through his revolution, was able to change the entire course of history. And every person, every group of individuals that have followed Imam al Hussein and have taken him as a model of emulation, who have taken him as an inspiration, you find that they've become successful in implementing revolutions and changes for the betterment of humanity. And the examples are numerous over here Muslims and non-Muslim figures who took Imam al Hussein as an inspiration who led revolutions based on that motivation and that inspiration from the revolution of Imam al Hussein this courage this uh, ability to have a stance and to say no to oppression to to be able to be motivated to live your life through a value which is captivated in the statement Hayhat minna dhilla. this needs motivation this needs inspiration and you cannot find this in anyone other than say the Imam Hussein Ali therefore it is imperative for the Muslim nations that in order to stand up and to gain this inspiration to learn how to overcome injustice in a non-violent manner despite being in a minority refer back to Imam al Hussein. and for this reason Haji you will find that every dictator will do everything in his power to ensure that his people are disconnected from Imam al Hussein from the time of Shah Pahlawi to the time of Saddam to the time of the imperialists and Whoever it is, you will find if they're a tyrant and a dictator, the first thing they do is that they wage war against the dhikr of Imam al Hussein, Because they've understood that if you disconnect the people from Imam al Hussein, they will always submit to oppression. But as soon as the people are introduced to Imam al Hussein, they are allowed to seek inspiration from Imam al Hussein. We are able to stand up in revolution and make this world a better place for all humanity. Thank you so much, Sheikh Abbas Panju. Inshallah, the upcoming Hajj pilgrimages will be under new authorities. You are very welcome. Thank you, Sheikh Abbas Panju, Stanmore, London, UK. Again, we apologize to our dear viewers for the poor video quality. Brothers and sisters, this concludes today's current events. We hope to see you next time. We thank you, dear viewers, for watching, and we thank our dear guest, Sheikh Abbas Panju, for joining us. Be sure to join us next time on current events. Until next time, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.